okay so we will uh, i'll just clear up one issue that we had left over from last class right and then uh, there is one topic that i want to talk about because that brings me to a summary of some of the things that we have been doing in this course okay and then in tomorrow's class we will do a closure so you can tell your friends and everybody to be ready to try to recollect what we did in the last 40 plus class is that fine okay so we will try to make that a collective affair so we will see if we can together recollect what happened in the last uh, bunch of class it's an overview right so that is fine now uh, before I go so we had uh, there was some issue we had a problem uh, we had j of u as integral a to b x squared by 2 dx given u of a we called it u sub a and u of b as u sub b right this is what this is this is where we were and I had discretized this using hat functions and got something that looks like this so I will just I will just sort of write this out you can work out right you can work out if there is some issue the whole point is actually you have to just go through it blindly the minute you start counting you can start making mistakes so this turned out to be a 1 over 2h if I remember right I am doing this from memory so just make sure that I do not make any mistakes i equals 1 through uh, n minus 1 minus u i u i minus 1 plus u i squared plus u i u i plus 1. I should really write the secular terms in front so that there is no confusion with they make a mistake minus yeah did I get a 2 u i squared okay is that fine okay and then of course you have these terms which is uh, plus a u a squared by 2 h plus a u b squared by 2 h right. So what we do is we want to find the extremum we want to find uh, depend on maximum and minimum depends in fact on whether you how you write right whether it is minus u x x squared or minus u x x or u x x uh, I differentiate this with respect to u j as I said because the second example I gave I did this funny counting right and if you want to check this out you can actually count and see. So what does this give me this gives me uh, 1 over 2 h summation i equals 1 to n minus 1 and we just go through this blindly okay so this gives me uh, minus do u i do u j u i minus 1 a uh, minus u i do u i minus 1 do u j plus 4 u i do u i then uh, minus do u i do u j u i plus 1 I am sort of learning out a space so I will write it underneath a uh, minus u i do u i plus 1 do u j okay and this whole thing is in the under the summation constants of course disappear is that fine okay. So if you say j equals 1 or j right j equals some particular value then uh, obviously depending on what is the do u 2 do u 1 is 0 right so only if i equals 1 it works right so this is going to work so each one of these derivatives 
is going to work so if j equals 1 only if i minus 1 is 1 it works right so you find out when these are non zero so this is non zero if i is j this is non zero if i minus 1 is j right this is non zero if i is j this is non zero if i plus 1 is j am i making sense is that okay and this is non zero if i plus 1 is j uh, this should be i equals j i equals j so if you say i equals j then that becomes j minus 1 if i is j then that becomes j j minus 1 so this is uh, minus u j minus 1 this is u j plus 1 and this one is 4 u j minus u j plus 1 and this should be u j minus 1 this is the derivative for j equals 1 through n minus 1 right now we are going to pick each of the j's for each one of the j's j equals 1 we differentiate set it equal to 0 get an equation j equals 2 we differentiate set it equal to 0 get an equation you understand so we will get a bunch of these equations we are going to set it equal to 0 and this is for j equals 1 through n minus 1 you understand what I am saying okay there is a 1 over 2h outside that I have left out okay so this is just by way of otherwise uh, so this is uh, uj minus 1 plus 2uj minus uj plus 1 by h equals zero. Okay, if you multiply and divide by h, it obviously looks like the second derivative being set equal to zero. Is that fine? Okay. Fine. Yeah. So I just wanted to clear that up. The other possibility is actually, if you enumerate, since it's in one dimension, you can actually enumerate. You can count them. Okay. You can count them, and you may get a different recursive formula here or you may get a different expression you could write it in a different fashion right because they are sums you can combine them in different fashion so if you wanted to collapse you wanted to co you wanted to combine this with that you could actually do it if you rewrite the sums a little you could write this as jh of u is 1 over 2h oops 1 over h and I am just doing this from memory so you can check it out later summation a minus ui ui minus 1 plus u i squared plus u a squared by 2 h i equals 1 through n so the n is there minus u b squared by 2 h you can check this out okay the nth one here shows so you can rearrange these terms it is just a matter of how you collect the terms okay there are different ways by which you can combine the terms so you could get something of this sort if you wanted to combine the i plus 1 term with the i minus 1 term but my suggestion is all of this work you can do this kind of stuff very easily when you are dealing with uh, 1D one dimensional you know the problems are relatively simple it gets a little messy when once you go to multiple dimensions okay so I, I, I bring the uh, calculus of variations it is not as I said it is not quite finite element method but uh, there is a you have an idea that you can you can use these hat functions and right various basis functions that we develop to uh, solve differential equations there is a variational form so you have the differential form the differential equation form and then there is a variational form that is associated with that differential equation there is a relationship between them okay so there is a uh, completely different class of te techniques that you may or may not have seen earlier okay they are completely different class of techniques that is fine now what we will do is we will uh, change gears a little right we um, so it is it, sort of an abrupt change from what we are doing, doing so far but it is okay it does not matter I mean, since we are near the end of the semester it is a natural 
natural progression. Uh, you know, generally, uh, I am going to pick a, tab, a topic which is uh, normally taboo in most uh, uh, cultures, which is gambling. Right? So, gambling is illegal, supposedly illegal in India. I say supposedly because if you go do the right paperwork, I can actually come to you and make a bet. I could bet, for instance, that I am going to, I bet 1000 rupees that I am going to die tomorrow. Right? <laughs> right? And you can say, no, no, I bet 1 lakh rupees that you will not. You would, of course, be an insurance company and I would be a person who is coming to you paying 1000 rupees as a premium. Are you making sense? So, there are this business of gambling is a very, very strange, is a very strange thing. So, there are lots of situations if you actually look at it, you can finally decompose it into some form of a gamble, okay, some form of a gamble, right. So, I give that example of insurance to rationalize the fact that I am going to give, take gambling as a motivation, okay, a game of chance. Let me call it instead of gambling, let us call it a game of chance. So, there are two players in this game of chance. The two players are, for lack of anything better, I will call them A and B. There are two players A and B in this game of chance and between the two players, they have uh, some tokens, say 100 chips. The tokens are what they use to figure out who is winning, who is losing. So, between the two players, they have 100 chips. Okay. So, at any given time, at any given time, if x has, a has x chips, b has 100 minus x chips. So, what we would call a zero sum game, okay. So, if a wins, b loses, right. So, it is, it is there is no win win situation here. That is what I mean when I say it is a zero sum game, right. So, we simply, if b wins, a loses. So, we know that if we know the story of one of them, we know what is the story of the other. It is a complementary story. So, we would like to know, we will just look at A. We will now ignore B. We will just look at the story of A. What is the story of A? So, you can be wondering what the heck does this have to do with CFD? So, we will see whether it has, whether the story has anything to do with CFD or what we have been doing so far. So, if A has X chips, now you have concern. Now we ask the question: What is the probability that A will be ruined? By A will be ruined means through a sequence of through a sequence of events that A has zero chips. Okay. So what are the events? The event is what is called a round. After each round, right? After each round, whatever that round is, uh, there is a probability. There is a probability. P that A will win the round and if A wins the round, one chip is transferred from B to A, okay. So, with the probability P, with the probability P, right, at any given round, A will win that round. With the probability Q, so this is win. With the probability Q, A will lose the round. Is that fine? Everybody? So, yes, this is all very nice. This is a, this is that single round, but what I would like to know, what A would like to know, right? What I would like to know is if A has X chips, what is the probability of ruin? What is the probability that A is ruined given that A has X chips? You understand what I am saying? So, we will call that probability, probability of ruin, probability of ruin because of A given X chips, we are just setting up the problem, we are giving, doing, we are doing, uh, so that is Q of X, is that fine? Probability of ruin is Q of X. Fine, everyone. So now you start. We basically say that A starts with X chips. You start uh, start the start the process. You go round one, round two, round three, round four, and you ask the question: What happens? So if you are at if you are at round one, 
and you have x chips so q of x q sub x is the probability that you get that a gets ruined after one round with probability p it could be x plus 1 chips and the probability that a gets ruined with x plus 1 chips is q of x plus 1 what is the other possibility that you lose with the probability q and you have q of x minus 1 chips okay. So the probability that you get ruined having x chips is in fact the probability that you go to x plus 1 and then get ruined p into q x plus 1 plus the probability that you go to x minus 1 and get ruined plus q into q x minus 1 okay right okay so just say the, the, it can be the, if they are if one of them is not cheating then p may p is likely to equal q they are not cheating i say p q because one of them may be cheating but if they are not cheating then p is likely to equal to q right but we know that p plus q is 1 you know that p plus q is 1 right there are only two possible i have i have enumerated the two events there are only two possible events okay so you either go from here you transition so i use the word transition you transition from x to x plus 1 right with the probability q you understand what i'm saying or you transition from x to x minus 1 with the probability p here the probability q there so qx would be this fine okay now if it turns out that neither of them is cheating and it's an even game then p equals q equals Equals one half. So this tells me that if I substitute q x equals q x plus one plus q x minus one divided by two. Yeah. This is round n. This is round n. This is round n minus one. But I'll count the other way around. I'll count the other way around. So this is. I'll decrement instead of incrementing. Now this is starting to look familiar, right? So what I do is I sub subtract, I subtract q x minus q x uh, n minus one from both sides. So I get q x n minus q x n minus one equals q x plus one n minus one plus two q x n minus one q x minus one n minus one subtract so I have minus divided by 2 right this 2 comes because in the denominator I have a 2 this looks like heat equation this looks like the discretization of heat equation is that fine okay so we started off with two gamblers we are talking about the ruin and we end up with the heat equation what is the deal how does this how does this help us what does this do for us what does this do it looks like the discretization of heat equation this is one half you remember the stability condition for heat equation that is we created a we had a parameter this is lambda one half is lambda lambda equals one half if you go back to the heat equation which was kappa delta t by delta x squared okay that is exactly at that at that stability margin at that stability on the edge of that stability envelope okay so yeah it is the heat equation it looks like the discretization of the heat equation fine so before uh, let okay let us see so we have the heat equation we need boundary conditions what how, where do the boundary conditions come from this is all very nice this looks like the discretization of the heat equation where does the boundary condition come from you go back here go back here if x has 0 chips then the probability that x loses is 1 because you are not that is it you have nothing the game does not go on anymore you understand what I am saying so q of 0 q of 0 q not of 0 q sub 0 is 1 right and if x has 100 chips 
then the probability of loss is 0 because you have already won you understand. So the boundary conditions are is q of the, the probability of ruin if you have 100 chips is 0 is that okay is that fine okay. So here the it looks like our usual heat equation discretization of the heat equation we have the boundary condition so that is a, a hundred uh, this is zero that is a grid point zero that is a grid point hundred and q of zero is one q of one hundred is zero okay and what you would do is you would take in between you would take values and you would take the averages would keep evolving in time it would keep evolving in time and what is the solution going to be what is the solution to this equation u t equals kappa u x x it is going to be a straight line going from going down from 100 to 0 so that gives you the probability distribution basically it is going to be a straight line going from well probability 1 to 0 and the y value there is 0 is that fine everyone okay of course there is a difference here I am, I am this is a continuum there there are discrete chips there there are discrete chips this is a continuum that means somehow I have to fragment the chips if I want to do this limiting process I have to keep breaking the chips down right I have to keep breaking the chips down what we do know is the limit of that equation as delta x goes to 0 as the size of the as the quantization of that chip goes to 0 it goes towards the heat equation is that okay so that equation is consistent with the heat equation so before we before we set about asking ourselves the question instead of solving instead of solving the heat equation so that is a finite difference representation of the heat equation okay so before we go about wondering we talked about probabilities and all that and can we use those probabilities directly to solve this problem right instead of instead of working at the way where we have just worked it right now this would be this is called uh, the Fokker Planck equation you heard this term maybe not okay that is fine so we have what we are basically doing is we are basically showing that this process this random process there is a random process there are two people playing they are tossing a coin or something of that sort this is a random process there is a uh, continuous equation associated with it okay where u is the probability u is the probability okay and you can solve it using the finite difference techniques that we have got so we have done so far okay the point that I want to make so right why do I bring this up at this point in the semester the point that I want to make is it is consistent the scheme is consistent whatever that process that I explained is consistent right is consistent with the heat equation it converges to the heat equation right if you have molecules bouncing around you do some kind of uh, limiting process or averaging or whatever it is consistent with the heat, the heat equation if you are looking at energy equation if there is no motion in the sense that no drift velocity no mean velocity then the energy equation de degenerates to the heat equation okay if I do a finite difference scheme in this fashion if a finite if I do a finite difference scheme in this fashion it is consistent it is consistent with the heat equation so if I start with the heat equation and I discretize it using a finite difference scheme or I discretize it using calculus of variations and differences I discretize it using finite element method whatever it is I generate an automaton I show it is consistent all of these there are a variety of models at the discrete level whether they are molecules whether it is some uh, some A and B gambling you understand all of these all of these in some limiting sense are governed by the heat equation okay so in CFD what we are basically doing we say oh we have the fluid flow 
which is a process we have con done continuum and got a differential equation there was a limiting process then we are saying there is this numerical scheme there is consistency convergence and all of that stuff going on they both model the same equation they both both in the limit go to the same equation so we are saying that i will use the discretization that i have done to model the reality of these molecules am i making sense we are basically saying well this is equivalent to that because both of them in the limit go towards this differential equation am i making sense is that okay so what is the underlying what is the underlying automaton that you do what is whether do you discretize using uh, finite difference method do you discretize using finite element method do you discretize using something like this we'll figure out how to do this okay do we do something like this so there are different ways by which there are different uh, it's not microscopic you understand so microscopic would be to do it at the molecular level that is too much because you already know that the number of molecules you are talking about is of the order of avogadro number of molecules you know, it is a huge number 10 power 23 so you turn we back out from there and say well here are these 100 grid points that seem to go to the same problem that seem to go to the same differential equation am i making sense okay so the underlying process that you pick what we are what we are what we are trying to do here is we are trying to come out with a discrete representation some kind of a discrete representation which will simulate which goes towards the same differential equation that are alternate discrete the, the one that we are trying to simulate goes to even though it is discrete is that fine okay so that that at one level that is that is the point that I that is why I wanted to show you something that was very different now the point is I have shown you from here I have shown you that we get the same governing equations I did this simply to show you that you get the same equation okay but this is not how I am going to solve it if I solve this I am solving finite difference method if I solve this equation then I am saying right instead of gas flow or instead of a, a, a solid rod being con, a heat conduction being governed in a solid rod right by the heat equation I am saying oh the heat equation governs this and I will solve it using finite difference method that is not the objective here you could do it but that is not the objective here what we will do instead is we will ask the question what we have what we have stated here as a problem can it be modeled as such can it actually be modeled as such so in order to do that you need to create 101 bins containers right you need to create 101 bins and if you have if you have a, a chip or a colored ball in that bin for that you can toss a coin and you can decide whether that ball goes to the right or the ball goes to the left right you can decide whether the ball goes to the right or ball goes to the left the probability in this case because p and q are both equal to half the probability half the ball will either go to the left or the ball will go to the right am i making sense okay so that that much is clear so we have already we have already done this i want this is important i want you to, this this picture i don't want you to, so given that your x it either goes to the right or goes to the left fine this picture is important so we come back here so what do we have so I have in each one of these what how many how many balls does the first bin have well it just depends on what is the discretization of the probability that you want to do right so the probability in the first one is 1 the probability okay the probability in the first bin is the probability that in the that a ball in the first bin the probability is 1 okay so what I am going to do is I am going to make sure that there are I will, I will quantize so the probability is 1 that 0 to 1 that magnitude 1 I will quantize using 100 balls which means that each ball represents 1 hundredth of a probability okay. So whatever happens here whatever happens here so when if you if you start off with 100 balls and you basically say I'm going to toss a coin or whatever and decide what what's to happen. What is the what is the end result after that one round? It's possible that one ball ends up here. 
right it is possible that one ball ends up here or the ball goes into oblivion which does not make sense but anyway so if there are for each of these if you do that then if there are only 99, 99 balls or 98 balls then I top it off because it is supposed to be 100 at all time okay. In the last bin if there is a, a ball or a chip that shows up there I remove it because there are supposed to be none there is that fine okay right and you just this is the game that you play. So you just basically say that I have I have a I have a I have a chip here or I have a ball here I toss a coin the ball either ends up here or here fine and what you will see is all of these balls jumping around fine normally um, unfortunately we do not have a time for time for a demo for this but you could actually try this this is very easy to program okay. The critical thing that you need here is a random number generator. right you need a random number generator. So to generate pseudo random numbers I would suggest that uh, you read right you read uh, Knuth's The Art of Computer Programming Volume 2 Semi Numerical Algorithms. There are lots of there are lot there is lots of materials out there material out there on uh, there is a lot of material out there on generating random numbers okay. I think if I remember it this book has like 100 pages or 150 pages it is quite 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 a lot of uh, space dedicated to it and uh, is very important as they jokingly say I forget who said this but random numbers are too important to leave to chance. So you have to generate them properly these are you cannot just generate you understand what I am saying. So the standard uh, random number generator that you see out there may not be the best generator there are lots of random number generators but make sure that you are using a good random number generator. Your computer may have a random number generator which is a true random number generator meaning that it is based on the thermal state of a diode somewhere and the CPU is actually using a A to D converter to read that read read the read off the voltage random voltage that is coming from it not a good idea you are writing a program you want a random number generator but you want to use what are called pseudo random numbers which is what he is going to give you right because you are not sure whether your program when you are developing your program you do not know whether your program is working or not and to throw into that some random effect is not what you want right. So you have random numbers that are actually not random numbers. I mean there is a sequence of numbers that look random but you know what they are beforehand and then you can debug your program right because every time you run it it is not going to do something different and you are saying is it because there is a bug in the program or is it because my random numbers have changed. So you generate the random numbers debug your program and then you can do whatever you want but I would still suggest that you stick with pseudo random numbers okay you stick with pseudo random numbers is that fine okay. So so if you if you have a pseudo random number generator that generates uniform deviates uniform distribution on uh, 0 1 right then it is less than 0 0.5 it is a heads it is greater than 0 0.5 it is a tail I mean it is very easy right and okay is that fine it is very easy basically what you are trying to do is you are trying to generate uh, random numbers in fact what you want is just two states minus 1 and plus 1 the way I have implemented it I just generate a minus 1 and plus 1 and I add it right I shift it to the appropriate bin I shift I shift to the previous bin or I shift to the next bin is that fine okay. So and what you would expect is that you, you would sort of see some you would see movement and then there will be a point when you finally get to the solution that you are not going to get you are not going to get that that is only remember that you are dealing with random numbers I do not know whether you have dealt enough with probability theory and so on but you are dealing with random numbers so you are not going to get a straight line it is not just going to go to a straight line and sit there it is going to be jumping about that straight line. So what you are going to do is you are going to get variations about the straight line the straight line is the expectation right of your random process the straight line is the expected line. So you are going to see the function grow and 
sort of uh, it is going to be jumping about that, it is going to be hovering about that, okay, right. Right, as I said, uh, there is another way that we can do this. Here, what we have done is we have taken bins and we have tracked, we have kept track of, we have kept track of what is coming and going out of the bin. That is like an Eulerian method from the fluid mechanics lingo, it is like an Eulerian method. Right. The other possibility is that you do, do a Lagrangian method. Lagrangian method is you follow a particle. You follow a particle. So if you follow a particle, I get back here as I promised. If you follow a particle, so you are here, you toss a coin, you go from this part, this point to that point with probability half and then you toss a coin again. So one at each toss these are actually bins you understand what I am saying these are actually bins it is moving from one bin to another bin but right now I am following that solitary I am following that solitary particle okay and in a similar fashion you could have you could have so this is called a path it is a particle trace so it is called a path. called a path okay so you could start off you could start off each one of these in a similar fashion so it's possible that uh, some of them are biased in some fashion so the, the, you can you you can you can trace and i seem i seem to have biased it this fashion but it may not be biased right you start off a you start off a you start off on a path okay so you can make you can you can track you can create generate multiple paths so from this point you could generate 200 odd paths okay and at uh, at any given time you can find how those 200 odd paths would end up at that time level right and you will get a distribution the distribution you may get a distribution of some kind am i making sense is that okay you get a distribution of some kind so it gives you an idea that if something starts here what is the probability that it will end up in any given spot fine is that okay of course in this case in this case if it goes to if it goes to the zero side it's just going to get eaten up so zero is what we call the absorbing boundary condition it's called an absorbing boundary condition it just eats up anything that comes to it is gone anything that comes to the zero side is gone this is called the absorbing boundary condition and since since i'm talking about since i'm talking about random numbers and uh, distribution of some kind right and since i'm talking about random numbers and the distribution of some kind and the toss of a coin and so on this class of schemes are called monte carlo schemes this class of schemes are called monte carlo schemes is that fine okay so you could actually so this, this would be the text you know you could actually start off you could you could start off at different points and go through the same process and you could uh, so this is this is uh, this this is used i mean in a very variety of ways now that i have mentioned now that i have mentioned monte carlo i'll just say a little something about monte carlo schemes right the most important part of monte carlo schemes of course is the random number generator right so since i am not sure as to what your background of probability theory and uh, uh, right i don't think have you guys looked at seen any have you done probability theory hmm? okay so maybe then i don't say anything about stochastic processes so there's a second step that you can go to called the stochastic process i'll just write out the equation because i didn't intended at least that you be familiar with it right so a typical st stochastic differential equation
okay. So, uh, if I am talking about the prob uh, probability distribution is a normal distribution Gaussian normal this is the mean also called the drift this sigma square dt is the variance rather so these are dz z are random dz are random numbers which are who have variance which have variance that looks like uh, well the combination looks like sigma square dt variance looks like sigma square dt. So if you look at if you think about it you may say what is this equation right what is the strange equation this equation basically describes that process there what I have shown what I have shown there is with it could be mu 0 or if you look at it if I, what I have actually drawn it is drifting to one side you understand. So it is possible that you can imagine if you just had simple diffusion if you had just had simple diffusion. So simple diffusion is uh, the, the best way for me to describe it is you have some fluid flow in this direction I have I set up the fluid flow so that I have a time like direction in the in the downward direction as time progresses something that was here will end up is travelling at a constant speed we already know that right propagation speed is a it will travel down downstream okay. So if I drop some dye there some ink there this is the example that I gave in the beginning when I was talking about linear wave equation I said oh I put some chalk dust and the chalk dust is carried along advection and then I said there is a diffusion but we are ignoring diffusion now I am going to talk about the diffusion. So I put dye there what happens to that dye as it goes as it goes along when I when I if I drop dye so the dye is carried down and it also starts to diffuse it also starts to diffuse. So the distribution of dye that you expect is something like this the distribution of dye is something like this something like that which we could have got by random walk that process that I wrote there is also called a random walk random walk okay the process of generating paths is also by a random walk that is I take a part particle and I take I, I go through I go through I take so many steps randomly okay it is a random walk and this envelope basically shows maybe 10,000 such paths that I have drawn and I get a distribution that looks when I look at the end this is the distribution that I get random walk that is because the flow is in this direction what if I added a small velocity as so a very tiny velocity component that way left to right. So you would expect that that will be the distribution will be slightly distorted so what will happen is you will get something. and the distribution may be something like that am I making sense it will be slightly distorted. So the drift velocity mu that is the mu that is drift okay and this is the pure Gaussian process am I making sense okay and you have seen this before. So normally when we did as I said earlier when we are talking about uh, we are talking about for molecules or it is the same same differential equation that finally comes up. So when you are talking about when you did some element of statistical mechanics earlier in your physics or chemistry or whatever you would have seen that you break up the you break up the, the motion of the individual molecules which you have considered to be hard spheres you break it up into a, a drift component and a variance about that drift a change about the drift. The drift component gives you what you call the speed of the fluid at that point in the continuum and the variance gives you the measure gives you variance gives you what measure of the temperature right the variance gives you a measure that becomes an internal variable the temperature becomes an internal variable right therefore you tie it to internal energy it becomes an internal the internal it is beneath or it is beneath what we see in the continuum that we can capture in the continuum we can only capture this the variance becomes an internal variable okay as I said the objective of doing this 
whole business was for me to make tie up a few of these. I wanted to connect. I wanted to connect a few of these things together. So, if you have a stochastic differential equation of this sort, what it basically says is yes, you have the drift component. You have you, what you would normally call what you would have seen in your physics and chemistry as the drift velocity, and then you have added to it the random component about it, which you capture in the form of some kind of a variance, which is actually a measure of the temperature. Okay, so in that sense, this equation isn't very different from something like CPT naught is CPT plus u squared by two. One has the drift, drift count, but of course, this is an energy equation, not the same. Be, be careful. I'm just drawing. Draw, I'm just writing this out. It just sort of struck me randomly, and I wrote it right now. But uh, there's a relationship. You understand what I'm saying? This is in terms of energy. It's not in terms of speeds itself. But uh, that's basically it. So here, what you could do is, so if you had a stochastic differential equation like this, you can actually generate normal, the normal uh, random numbers using normal distribution with mu and sigma squared or mu and one, depending on how you want to do it, right? Mu and one, mu as the mean and one as the variance, or this would be z would be zero mean and unit variance. Then mu would be the mu would have the would take care of the drift change in the mean and this would take care of the the random steps is that fine is that okay are there any questions right so these monte carlo schemes they can be used for various things i give you a last a typical application because it's about distribution it's about distributions and i give you the a uh, final uh, simple application not to differential equations this is most probably the kind of thing that you may have seen in school i am not sure if you've seen this in school so if you have some random shape for which you want to find the area right so if you're saying that what why are you doing all this random numbers what's happening right so let me give you let me give you uh, a, a, a simple straightforward application so if you want to find the area what do you want to do the process of integration actually you can find a bounding square which is which you can scale and the easiest thing i am i am going to break it up into blocks because that's my nature but the easiest thing to do is generate random numbers on the square generate so if this is x and that is y generate random positions so just say you generate 100 of them so these random positions maybe i should make a little make them a little bigger because it has to be seen so you generate a bunch of these random x's and y's okay there is a reason why i wanted to give this two dimensional one as an example i will tell you why because i have a warning at the end so you generate you generate a uniform distribution in both of them in both directions right so bivariate uniform and count how many you have inside divided by the total gives you the fraction of this this fraction of the total area am i making sense it's a relatively simple minded way to do it but it really works quite well so you can generate if you you could generate instead of 100 random numbers you can generate 10000 random numbers locate them all over right find out how many of them are inside the inside the area that you want find out how many of them are or what is the total number you know so this is of course you have chosen to be a square so the area of the square is very easy to find you can find out what is the area of that an estimate you can get an estimate of that area is that does that make sense is that okay the reason why i pick this the reason why i pick this is you want to make sure that the random numbers that you generate in the x coordinate direction and the random numbers that you generate in the y coordinate direction are not correlated okay so you really should be careful as i said it's not that simple of just generating the random numbers and using them okay they are not so you have to make ensure that the numbers are not are not correlated the other thing that you do is you are talking about pseudo random numbers we go back right right now to the beginning of this course we are talking about a finite representation of a number the mantissa is fixed 24 bits 
the mantissa is fixed it has 24 bits remember if I am generating random numbers between 0 and 1 all that matters, matters is the mantissa right 24 bits is 16 million numbers 24 bits is 16 million numbers that means that the best that you can get at every 16 million numbers you will have a cycle every 16 million numbers so if you have a good random number generator the cycle will be 16 million if you have a pathetic random number generator if you have a bad random number generator every 100 it will keep repeating okay is that does that make sense fine okay so you go to double precision so that will give you a larger number of right or you use integers you do not need the exponent you are talking about numbers between 0 and 1 so you use integers and you are already at 4 billion random numbers if you have a good algorithm remember you can still have a bad algorithm so if you have a good algorithm that loop that it gets so if you go to two dimensions and if you generate 1 million random numbers 1 million x coordinate 1 million y you have already done two if you go to you understand what I am saying if you go to three dimensions four dimensions you can imagine now that your random numbers may start getting correlated there may be other issues okay so there are I do not want to give you this impression that these are actually relatively easy to implement they are not that efficient they are relatively easy to implement their convergence properties are not that good most of the times so will you you will use them when you are in a difficult situation you typically use them when you are in a difficult situation but otherwise what happens is you can you can go through this process but please please bear in mind that underlying all of your all the Monte Carlo schemes deep down inside the core of your scheme is a random number generator so you have to make sure that you understand that your random number generator is doing the right thing is that fine okay are there any questions okay fine thank you